25th anniversary chapel, and you are invited if your day can accommodate 11 o'clock on Friday. And then we had another good turnout last Thursday with Subversive Orthodoxy. A week from this Thursday, our next meeting with or Subversive, or Subversive Orthodoxy. Uh, the, the topic is, how do children worship with Professor Mimi Larson? Let me encourage you, it's not my place to maybe, but encourage you that this topic is vital for the life of the local church. How do children worship? And may I say, from my perspective as a longtime worship director, I believe it's vital to the health of evangelicalism that we understand how children worship and what it means to have children worshiping with us. So we look forward to hearing from Mimi and having that conversation and uh, stretching um, our understanding of this in a culture um, that, we, that we're living in, especially a church culture that we live in. And now will you stand with me and we will read responsively from Psalm 97 for our call to worship. You'll read the part in yellow. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. All worshipers are of images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Lord, would you be exalted in our time that we spend singing your praises, hearing your word, bowing in prayer, and being transformed into the image of Jesus. Amen.
Please be seated. Thank you to Aaron and Alex for planning and preparing and leading us in singing, our singing part of our worship this morning. Dr. McGarry will read scripture in just a moment and our speaker today is uh, Dr. Iswa Atson. He's a TEDS graduate, a PhD in systematic theology, pastored the Church of Christ in Nations in Jos, Nigeria, and lectured at Gindiri Theological Seminary, also in Nigeria. He's currently visiting assistant professor of theology at Trinity Christian College in Palos Heights and made the long, uh, well, the short trip today because he didn't go down to Palos Heights. He's, he's here with us instead. So don't make a mistake and go to Palos Heights when you want to be in Deerfield. So. But will you join me now in prayer? Lord God, mighty God, you dwell in light unapproachable. You reign and we see your reign all around us in the changing of the seasons, in the brightness of the sun, in the power of the storm. Fire goes before you, your lightnings light up the world. We see and Lord, we tremble as those who believe there is a God. You are a mighty God. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. The heavens declare your righteousness and all peoples around the earth have evidence of your glory, bringing rain to the righteous and unrighteous alike, providing for the growth of crops, providing for the needs of children, parents, and families. Overseeing and controlling the events of the world, raising up and putting down, raising up the, the humble, putting down the proud. We see this happening in our day and in our time, and we understand that in your righteous and glorious work, we will see it done completely and ultimately at the end of time when you bring all things together into submission and all of us bow at the, at the, before the throne and confess that Jesus is Lord. Your judgments are just, O oh Lord, and we thank you, we praise you for your righteous judgment, but we also bow in submission to it and ask that whatever in us is opposed to your righteousness, whatever in us disguises your glory, whatever in us might turn people away from seeing the Savior, you would reveal that to us, that we would stand as those judged um, and judged graciously held to account, but that account covered by Jesus. Lord, in these moments, we just pause and we ask you to examine our hearts.
Help us, Lord, to grow in honesty and in humility and then in dependence on you, confidence in the work that you have done through Jesus and then in joy. The joy that is ours as we have received the gospel, the joy that is ours by the Holy Spirit transforming us into the image of the Son, um, washing away those things which um, have stuck to us but by the power of the Holy Spirit you are redeeming and sanctifying and cleansing and renewing in us. We thank you for the joy that comes with ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit and the joy that we have in anticipating the full and final redemption of our bodies, the restoration of this world, and the kingdom of God with Jesus as its Lord. Lord, we pray for gospel ministry in this place among ourselves as we speak the gospel to each other in the words of the, uh, of the scriptures and in the way we encourage one another to stand fast in the gospel and to uh, live a according to the principles of renewal that come with the gospel. Lord, we pray for the ways that as students and faculty we are involved in gospel ministry on campus and in our churches and in Mosaic and in other places where we, um, where we encounter uh, those who have not yet heard or who are hearing but not yet understanding. Lord, you have entrusted us with the gospel and we want to be faithful to that in this place and in this hour and in all the places and all the hours that you give us. We think of churches globally and how uh, the gospel has gone out around the world and how it is um, hidden in some places only, be, um, only because there are no public churches, but the gospel never hidden, the light never covered, as those who know you um, speak the gospel to family members and clan members and neighborhoods and people groups, often serving amid opposition and we ask, Lord, that uh, where your church is oppressed, uh, where it is um, under suspicion, where it is both spiritually and politically suspect, Lord, that you would give the church strength. You would give the church, um, you would equip the church to do the work of ministry in the midst of warfare, in the midst of economic troubles church uh, in transition with people groups um, uh, fleeing oppression and um, living as refugees. Lord, would you equip, provide, and would you use us in any way that you, that you are able to, any way that we can be instruments of your gospel work, your service work, serving the least of those who are among us in our arms reach, but also around the world. Lord, we pray for Puerto Rico and their uh, recovery from the devastation of uh, Hurricane Fiona. And we ask, Lord, that uh, the resources of the church would be um, be put into place, um, that the church would rise to the, the present challenge, knowing that the church itself is also um, deeply hurting from this devastation with no quick resolution or, or repairs in sight. Um, Lord, would you um, bring to bear the resources of a wealthy world to help the parts of the world that are not able to, by their own means, to recover. And we think of another storm brewing uh, threatening Cuba on its way to Florida. Uh, Lord, again, we just ask that you would have mercy for families, communities, and that your mercy would be seen in your people as they serve, even those who serve as they suffer. We pray for the church in Ukraine, Lord, that uh, first of all, that you would bring that country to a just and honorable and righteous peace, that you would equip the church uh, through the... Um, the ministry of, of chaplains that are um, serving in the Ukraine military, churches as they assist those who are in transition within the, within the country, 
the ministries to Ukrainian refugees as they find their ways to other parts of Europe and the church rises to meet yet another refugee um, challenge in Europe. Lord, would you grant great grace and strength and resources to bear on that. As we approach a, a time of, uh, of national elections, statewide elections, Lord, we ask that, that you would um, um, be at work among your people, give us a unity of thought and of perspective and of uh, commitment to, um, to the, the responsibility, the privileges that you have given us. And Lord, that help us to see that you work even through our elections and then to work with you into and through and after those elections to, for your greater glory and so the gospel would not be hindered. We thank you, Lord, for the preaching of the word as we encounter it this morning in the letter to the Thessalonians. Lord, you are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Would you be exalted in our hearing and in our responding, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. Reading this morning from the ESV. I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the word. And we also thank God constantly for this. That when you received the word of God which you heard from us. You accepted it. Not as the word of men but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets who drove us out and displeased God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Thank you, Professor King, for the invitation. Thank you, Professor Gary, for the reading of the word. Um, it gives me great joy, and it's an honor to be standing here before all of you and before our great God and King. Let's pray. Our Father, we call upon you this moment. Oh, that it will please you to speak to us. Oh, that you will open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word. May your word come to us as life and a spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The story is told of a missionary, a Christian missionary, who went to this uh, community where the gospel has never been preached, uh, went along with his companion. And at a gathering of the people there, um, he, he began to preach the gospel message. And after the preaching of the message, so many of the people 
um, were excited to hear it. They believed it and received it with great joy. Um, and then he had converts. He had disciples and began to teach them. And the number was growing. However, the indigenous religious leaders in that community were not happy. Um, they were jealous with the growth that had just happened. So they incited a mob to go after this preacher. And the mob came one day to his house. Um, they were going to bring it down. They were looking for him. But as God would have it, he wasn't home that day. Um, so they took out his host and harassed him and extorted money from him. Um, and only God knew what would have happened to this preacher if he were home, if, if he, he was at home. Probably he would have been lynched. Well, with the threats, the believers decided that it wasn't safe any longer for him to stay in the village. And so they helped him to just get out that same night. Sounds like the story of any missionary in Africa or Asia or anywhere around the world where the gospel is being preached. But this is actually Paul, right? This is Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 17 at Thessalonica. They preached the message. It transformed lives. It brought in a harvest. And it brought about opposition. And that's our topic this morning, transformation and opposition. And the idea we see here is that every time the gospel message brings transformation, it attracts opposition. They go together. Each time it transforms lives, it arouses opposition. And, and we just have to be at home with that, right? And here we're asking the question, well, what kind of opposition do we see here? What kind of opposition does the transformative power of the gospel attract? And here in this passage we've just read, I think there are two kinds of opposition that we will consider. The first one you see in verse 13 to 16 is opposition from men. And the second one in verse 17 to 20 is opposition from Satan. So first, opposition from men. Well, here, according to Paul in verse 13, the Thessalonians, believers there, received the word of God that was preached to them by Paul and Silas. And he said, they received the word of God as what? The word of God. <laughs> right? Not as the word of, word of man. Not as the word of the culture. Um, not as the word in vogue. It was the word of God. And then he said, because they received it as the word of God, it was at work in them. And I think that is something we need to take to heart. That it is only when the word of God is received as the word of God that it will do the work of God in us. If it is received not as the word of God, it loses its power. And it is without effect. And we also see that the very source of their transformation becomes the cause of their opposition. Because Paul goes on to say that in doing that, the church in Thessalonica imitated the church of Judea or the churches in Judea. The same way that the gospel worked among the believers in Judea, 
and transformed them and brought in a harvest the same way it has done among the Thessalonians. But then, the kind of resistance and persecution and opposition that the churches in Judea experienced because of the work of the gospel, these believers also were experiencing. And here's where you have another similarity that gets interesting. Paul says that the churches in Judea suffered opposition from their own people, from the Jews, right? And he's saying, you also are experiencing opposition from your own countrymen, your own people. And that's how it has been everywhere in the world. When people receive the gospel, it is their own people, the people that they have always identified with, whether it is their ethnic group, their tribe, their nation, everything that they have been part of comes after them. Once you embrace the gospel as the word of God, just get ready. What you have identified with in the past becomes an enemy. I think this is where we can say to ourselves, number one, God's word, Hebrews 4.12 tells us, is living and active. And we need to always regard it as God's word. We need to always let it come to us and speak to us as the word of God. Because that is the only time it comes with power. Sometimes, especially for those of us who are in seminary, we start to lose our confidence in the scriptures as the word of God. I once read a tweet by uh, someone who said when she came to seminary, she had more confidence in the scriptures as the word of God than when she was finishing seminary. Because sometimes you go through seminary and for some reason, for some reason, whatever it is, you kind of lose your sense of reverence for the word you kind of lose that perception, that understanding of it as God's word. And then it stops having that work in you to transform, to renew, to change your own life. You know, sometimes we kind of go along with the culture. Now, it is, it is so true that the word of God should be contextualized in every culture, among every people. But you see, every time we so contextualize the word in our cultures such that it becomes very compliant to the culture, it is no longer countercultural, maybe it is no longer God's word that we're speaking. And, and it doesn't matter what it is. Cultural practices. And in fact, today, it is so easy for us to use the word merely as a tool in our own hands rather than in the hands of God. We use it to drive home all kinds of agendas from sexuality to gender, from race to national identities, religious practices from other religions, all kinds of things can be driven as agendas with the word, but not really with the idea that this is the word of God speaking to us to bring change, to counter the culture that contradicts the truth of the gospel. The second thing we see here is that there's also opposition from Satan. 
Men, of course, sometimes, actually all the time, are tools in the hands of Satan, right? And when we, 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 we encounter opposition from men, that is Satan using them to oppose the gospel. But then there are times that Satan himself comes after us. And this is something that Paul here experiences, right? Um, he, he says from verse 17, he wanted to go and see the believers in Thessalonica. He wanted to go and once again encourage them. And draw encouragement from them. But then he said, Satan stopped him. Satan hindered him. Now, if you see in the first part, there was hindering going on from the people who opposed the preaching of the gospel. Right? Uh, because Paul said the Jews opposed him and they hindered them from preaching the gospel to other Jews and to the Gentiles. That was a kind of hindering, getting in the way of the preaching of the gospel. The kind of hindering that he said Jesus himself experienced, the prophets experienced. But you see the kind of hindering here that we can only describe as spiritual warfare. Where Satan himself uses his powers, spiritual powers, to come after the workers of the gospel. Paul wanted to go there. Why? If you see, he says here that the Thessalonian believers were their joy, his joy, his source of encouragement, right? They were the reason why he said Paul and Silas would be able to stand before the Lord at his appearing with a crown to present, with a trophy to say, see the result of the work we have done for the kingdom, right? So that was a source of joy. That was a source of strength. And I think that Paul wanted to go there, of course, to keep building the work so that the transformation of the gospel would continue in that region, but also... It was for mutual benefit that Paul himself will derive joy and encouragement from them. You see, because Satan knows whenever ministers of the gospel no longer see the fruit of their work, they begin to get depressed. You begin to get discouraged. You begin to ask questions whether what you're doing is worth it. You begin to have an exist existential crisis whether you have lived well. Especially as you come towards the end of your life. And Satan blocked Paul. So that he will isolate him and just keep him in that place that... Many wise Christians have come to call the dark night of the soul, right? This is a place that a lot of great believers have gone through. Um, the story of Martin Luther uh, has that moment in his life where he was so spiritually depressed to the point that they thought he was going to die. And that he, he would hear this voice just telling him that probably he was wrong. <laughs> the voice would say to him, you are the one who knows everything, only you. And, and, and Luther was thinking, what if he has misled believers? What if he is wrong? And he's the one who is going to die and go to hell. And there was a point he thought that, yeah, actually he's going to die and go to hell. And there are many ministers who go through that. You just look at the church and it seems as if nothing is happening. No one is changing. Their lives have been the same the way you've known them before. And Satan begins to make you think nothing is going on. You're wasting your time. You're not a good minister. There's no fruit. 
Bayo Faminure, one of the most respected Christian missionaries in Nigeria, um, led the first indigenous mission agency in Nigeria called Kapu. Many years into his ministry, shared this story in a conference I, I attended several years ago. He said he entered a season of real darkness. Got to a point that he was so fed up with ministry because he felt he had wasted his entire life. He felt there was no good result to all the work he had done. And it was a place he couldn't pull himself out. And then he said, during a particular week, as he kept praying about it, one day he met someone at a bank. And the person stopped him or greeted him so respectfully. And he didn't remember seeing this person before. The person said to him, I just want to thank you. Many years ago, your ministry brought me to the Lord. And I'm still a Christian today because of your work. And after they left, suddenly the Lord reminded him, your work has fruit. And he said that week he met more other people that kept telling him the same thing. Either he encouraged them and they're still in the faith because of his work, or he brought them to the Lord. You may be going through that kind of experience, perhaps as a professor too. And sometimes Satan is blocking your access to the things God is doing through your students out there. Blocking your view from the lives that he is changing. The gospel you've been preaching is changing in your congregation. And the Lord is saying, be encouraged. Be encouraged. But that is an opposition we need to be ready to face. Every time there is transformation, there will be opposition. Now, what do we do? The oppositions that we face only attest to the fact that transformation is taking place through the gospel that we are preaching. And so we just need to endure and keep holding on to the true gospel. Keep holding on to God's word as God's word and not given to the culture and keep enduring in the work of toiling for the gospel we have been entrusted with, bearing faithful witness as servants of the Lord. Amen. Please stand and join us as we respond by acknowledging where our worth is found.
love the Lord and hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. 